Morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to this uh, session on multisensory experiences and uh, all kinds of research that engages the senses. Um, the program is truly amazing, and I uh, want to thank, I want to take the time to thank the organizers for inviting me. And I'm really sad, though, to not be there and not be able to participate in all the amazing workshops. So um, I'll see what I can contribute from here. Um, today I'm going to talk about possible sonic futures. Imagining the urban soundscape. Um, I'm going to introduce some of the context for my work and um, give you some examples of, uh, of the newest project that I've been working on, which tries to imagine possible sonic futures. Uh, my work is a little bit less artistic, I think, than the rest of the talks today, but I I am trying to use um, critical approaches and um, and kind of imaginative, speculative listening as a form of method. So I hope that today I can add a little bit of a perspective on um, how to do that um, and and what I mean. And I'm really interested in urban sound and the tensions that arise from urban situations. So I want to start with two moments of experiential liminality, um, where we might see sound as it's just the sound of X, it's just the sound of this, it's just the, uh, but it's, it's a mere product of whatever is happening, but it's actually reverse un <laughs> untangling it uh, reveals a lot of layers of meaning. Um, and this is all pandemic related because of course we're still all very much um, recovering, uh, reimagining, understanding what the pandemic has meant for um, public life, for community building, for art, um, for mental health, and so on. So um, in the first picture, I don't have sounds here. I want to describe what's happening here. Um, in the first picture, we see uh, there's snow, um, there's people standing by the road, um, and there's a big truck with... Uh, um, exhaust coming out of the top exhaust pipes and what that is is uh, a picture from a local protest um, you might have heard of this on the news uh, it's it's odd the kinds of things that make it to the news but um, the uh, protest is for was by truck drivers who were protesting the vaccination mandate um, so, you know, like all over the world that we're framing this in terms of, um, you know, freedom and freedom of choice and not wanting to be uh, mandated to be vaccinated or to carry a vaccination card. Um, and the way that they sonically took up space, because it was very, very sonic, it wasn't actually just sonic. In Ottawa, in the capital, they camped out um, on Parliament Hill and uh, idled for days and played really loud music and and blew the horns the truck horns and uh i guess they probably already knew that but um the local rcmp the police like had no means of removing these giant trucks i mean how do you tow a giant truck so they were taking up sensorial space i mean the air quality uh decreased by it became almost putrid in Ottawa because of all the idling and uh, and uh, truck fumes and uh, the noise levels were um, incredibly high. Uh, it was all an incredible nuisance for the other um, residents, but it was a way of staking out protest. Um, in my local area, because these are two moments of my own experiential liminality, in my own local area, um, I live by a port and um, uh, a road that leads into the highway. 
So there's a lot of um, containers, shipping containers coming in and then a, a huge 24 seven a day truck traffic coming in, picking up um, the containers and taking them off the highway. Um, and so, you know, I live in close proximity to that. And uh, that was also, of course, the area that the local truck drivers concentrated their protest. So in a way, you know, the question that I'm asking here is who's who's listening? Who's uh, what does it mean to stake sonic space in this way? And um, because suddenly I, I was hearing truck horns and I that's not unusual. But I had this moment where I thought, that's a little too much. What's going on? And then I remembered, yes, the protests. That's what's going on. So um, it, it was this really a moment of switch between my mundanity, which is living the realities of living by a track road, and the realization, oh no, this is, uh, this is a sonic uh, takeover. This is uh, taking up space to protest something, to, you know, to kind of take, um, project sonically into the public sphere. So, um, the other picture is from a patio, a restaurant patio from uh, the last two summers, the last two COVID summers, where restaurants had a mandate of, uh, oftentimes they were restricted from indoor seating so they could only seat outdoors. So what ended up happening in terms of, I'm really interested in my work, I look a lot at urban planning and urban governance and the relationship between how the city polices and governs infrastructure and the sonic possibilities that can exist in the city. And, and what that means for community building. That's basically the essence of my work. Um, so what the city did with COVID is suddenly, uh, as you know, cities are notoriously slow and reluctant to give out any permits to allow any kind of change. Uh, there's a lot of rules, regulations, but suddenly they um, gave out a whole bunch of permits. So every restaurant was able to claim a little bit of street space and build up patio build a quick makeshift wooden patio and uh, in addition to building patios a lot of restaurants uh, also put up plexiglass separators in between seating in order to limit uh, the proximity or the you know the airflow between people so as an added measure for COVID um, what that added measure though also created and a few people have commented on this and probably most of you are uh, have noticed and are aware is uh, they also created really lovely um, sound dampening and uh, and suddenly when you're even indoor a, a restaurant you didn't have to shout to compete with all the noise because you had your own kind of sonic cocoon in which you can speak at a more conversational level and so it it kind of caused the general quieting of all the restaurants to the point where now city officials are telling me, I've been hearing this from a few and I've seen a few uh, news stories that um, the regulations for allowable noise levels uh, in entertainment venues are changing because people, people have been um, enjoying the kind of peace and quiet and the general quieting of their environment. They're not used to um, the loudness and the noise levels anymore. So Concert venues are going to have to go about 20 decibels, 20 to 30 decibels down from their allowable maximum. Um, and so would restaurants. And just for reference, in Vancouver, entertainment venues are allowed to make, believe it or not, up to uh, 94 decibels of noise, which is quite a lot. Um, and then uh, a lot of Folks have also talked about the um, the accessibility um, when you know when we talk about oral diversities and uh, how are any of these measures impeding people who are um, hard of hearing or um, or have different kinds of uh, um, hearing or neural sensitivities and so I would say that in some ways there's been um, there's been concerns raised about 
um, masks not allowing folks to lip read um, and and a lot of dividers uh, really muffle the sound and so if you are hard of hearing it's really hard to actually communicate um, but at the same time the general quieting of noise and especially these dividers uh, on in restaurants that generally decrease the amount of noise that is being made uh, I think those are really beneficial for folks with um, any kind of tinnitus uh, issues or uh, misophonia or, you know, neural sensitivities that, uh, um, uh, or sensory overload sensitivities. So we're talking a lot of folks with different kinds of neurodivergences uh, potentially being positively affected by this. And I'm really disappointed to see that some restaurants have decided to, now that they don't have to anymore, to take down these um, separators, plexiglass separators. Um, so that's that's the question then is, whom do we design soundscapes for? You know, uh, and, and why can't we, uh, as a city, what is preventing, what is the obstacle to making more holistic decisions about design? Um, so you're probably all uh, familiar with acoustic ecology, but I'm going to do a really quick uh, run through um, just to contextualize my own work um, and to provide a way that I understand acoustic ecology and, and the way that I interpret it in my work is um, some of the ways in which this wasn't repairing the urban soundscape was um, not well, it was actually one of the main Im Im impetuses for, or uh, uh, motivations for, uh, for the World Soundscape Project and for the work that Schaefer did and for the book that he wrote. He was really concerned about what he perceived as lack of, uh, of, of balance and, and some sort of loss of uh, uh, human scale of things. So... Um, he did hope that we could do more in the future than just turn down the volume. And I quote, noises are the sounds we have learned to ignore. Noise pollution today is being resisted by noise abatement. This is a negative approach. We must seek a way to make environment acoustics a positive study program. Which sounds do we want to preserve, encourage, multiply? I really, I'm going to give out my ending here and I'm going to say that I have really shifted fully away from how do we design a soundscape to how do we design the conditions, the space, the culture, how do we design those conditions that will result in a livable, community-oriented soundscape. So that's, to me, a really, actually, significant shift. Because if we think about repairing the urban soundscape, um, we're thinking about introducing small solutions as opposed to stepping back and thinking more um, holistically about it. Um, Acoustic ecology can be described as um, referring to a kind of invisible ecology of cities. And I think that's an idea that's still um, very much relevant today. And um, it's, it's a way, it's an interesting way of thinking. Um, ecology may have been um, a kind of flash of a certain time, um, interest in systems thinking and ecology of the 70s, environmental activists, movement, um, certainly ecosystems and biology inspired Schaefer to think about, well, what if we think of the sound as an eco, the soundscape as an ecosystem and um, each sound is like a species and they exist in relation to one another and some are um, more powerful and some are less powerful and, and, and sort of by, uh, by studying the interrelationships, by analyzing them, we can um, determine something about the health of that, the balance of that ecosystem. Um, and then the other, of course, 
really important part of acoustic ecology as a movement was a focus on listening and the listener is an active participant in the ecology of cities. Um, and this is idea, an idea that I think has not been developed as well as it should have because um, it kind of relates to this point that I just made, which is how do we not how do we repair a soundscape, but how do we create a culture of citizens, really, a, a kind of civic literacy where sonic um, sonic literacy is part of civic literacy, understanding um, the soundscape and having some uh, vocabulary to talk about um, sounds and having some understandings of how um, city sound is composed um, and what affects it. That is the kind of culture, generally, public conversations, public sphere conversations that we want to um, invite. And that might result then in having uh, better soundscapes. So acoustic ecology is the study of sonic environments uh, is uh, uh, the idea that a soundscape is an ecology of elements that reflect and I'm not sure that uh, Schaefer would have put it that way, but I want to define it in that way, that reflect material realities, social order, power structures, relationships, and communities. And it's ultimately concerned with the experience of living in the city, um, which I want to think, this is also a newish idea for me, um, I want to think of as a kind of user experience, because User experience design and UX um, have made such strides in service innovation design. Those fields have made such strides in uh, engaging in co-designing, uh, in, um, in doing design ethnographies and understanding a complex situation and how to affect it and in working with communities. And I kind of want to like borrow, uh, borrow some ideas from there or like see how how would it change thinking about the soundscape from that perspective from the perspective of you know user experience because one of the first questions with design when you're designing user experience is um you know whose job is it to create this experience who is the user um, what are the requirements what are the opportunities what are the challenges um what are the design parameters um, and then uh, more recent, more newer work, more contemporary work in user experience is really um, at the forefront are these questions of um, how to create this, how to make this experience inclusive, accessible, um, intersectional even. So uh, this picture that I'm showing you is actually um, a picture of uh, an area in the downtown port of Vancouver. It's an area that is, you know, the the area that is most often on postcards from Vancouver. It's uh, it's that area. Um, and this is part of Stanley Park and part of a, of a kind of seawall. These are the attractions, the outward attractions of Vancouver. Ooh, come to Vancouver. It's very green. And, um, and there's these, you know, lovely little, they created a kind of green roof. And um, all of this, I remember in my lifetime, this was created about 10 years ago, actually around the time of the 2010 Olympics. Um, there were a lot of capital projects, capital infrastructure projects that were created at that time. And uh, it's uh, really, really green and lush, but let's take a little look at um, this picture is from Vancouver in the beginning of the 20th century. Um, and I often like to show this to my students to highlight the fact that um, our environment our build our urban environment is is no accidental byproduct i mean it is a it is a product of decisions but it's a product of very deliberate and sometimes you know really shockingly different decisions um the first settlers uh that took over the space the space that vancouver sits on um 
they clear cut everything. I mean, they, there's not there's not a green blade of grass anywhere in this picture, and and that's the same for any pictures of Vancouver from that period of time. And from this to this uh, is another set of is another several decades of city planning, very deliberate city planning decisions, parks um, design decisions. So let's keep thinking about design. Um, as opposed to, I guess, art as uh, awareness raising and, and interventions. Um, I like, I find it interesting and stimulating to think about design instead, because it, it involves different kinds of people and different kinds of imagination. So I'm going to quickly read out this quote because I really like it. Um, it's from actually a, an, an article in a conversation called What Will the uh, Future City Sound Like? And it says, Privately, we sound design our lives more and more. City streets are like silent discos, with everyone lost in their own headphone-driven mix. But beyond that lies the shared urban environment, a neglected mashup that also needs designing. In a world where we are increasingly given the chance to customize our output, how do you orchestrate a planet where a gingham ringtone collides with the sound of a 1970s camera shutter from a smartphone? in a tube station resonating with Vivaldi to deter loitering. What is the future sound of cities? So we're already actually quite good at designing on a smaller scale. Um, a concept that borrowing from Jonathan Stern, um, I, I want to call musical architectonics. Um, and I use this exercise with my students as well. Um, again, not really playing any sound, but uh, showing them these two pictures of two, two different cafes, two different genres of uh, cafes. And I ask them, what is the soundscape of the one? What is the soundscape of the other? And so I'll ask the audience here to, to think about this for a moment and then to think about what in the materials, what, is, what in the furnishings, what in the structure and the shape of these rooms give us clues and give us ideas about um, how the space might sound like. And also what kinds of activities we imagine. I think, you know, I think there's a lot of, uh, of ideas that we get intuitively without even thinking about it. And I'm, I ask my students usually to kind of reverse engineer that thinking, those assumptions that we make. Like what kinds of people do we imagine here? What kinds of activities? What level of conversation? And then I finally ask them, which place is more expensive? <laughs> because there's a class, there's a class dimension to this, right? Associated with these choices. So, um, yeah, we're very good at designing on smaller scale. We, there's consultants in interior design who may or may not um, know or are aware of, um, uh, of acoustics, but on some level, they create a space that gives a certain vibe, creates a certain atmosphere. But how do we design purposefully and on a larger scale? Um, from room that we can you know, easily design to a public square, that's already more challenging. It's already more, um, there's so many more variables and then, then there's so much more users in the space that you have to consider, whose needs you have to consider. And then from public square to city, what are the possibilities and what are the barriers for sonic design? Um, I want to show you a, a little gallery um, from a one of many companies that have begun to specialize in um, acoustic treatments, acoustic panels. Uh, this particular gallery refers to um, examples of ceiling tiles, ceiling tiles that are used for um, noise dampening, reducing reverberation. Um, so you can see the amazing, also very visually appealing 
you know, these these are the companies that in some ways uh, are leading uh, on the cutting edge of thinking holistically. How do we make something beautiful that would like be inspirational and kind of delightful for people to look at, but also serve a function and create a kind of softening of the noises in that space. Um, this is a big problem, especially I work with some architecture firms and I, um, and I work with some um, consulting firms for office space. And uh, what I'm hearing a lot, and, and I, this is not news and I've observed this myself, is the move to the open space office has really created a lot of issues around noise. Um, and it's not just about the levels of noise, it's the lack of uh, defined spaces, it's the lack of acoustic zones, it's the lack of privacy in certain cases, it's the, it's the inability to focus because there's too many little sounds all around you. Um, and there's also a certain kind of vibe that um, those spaces have, uh, the, the aesthetic. Uh, the industrial aesthetic with super high ceilings and kind of barren walls. Well, guess what? That creates a lot of reflections, a lot of noise reflections and reverberation, and it creates a kind of cold atmosphere. So you can see the warmth of a lot of these fabric um, ceiling panels um, and other products that this company has. I think it's called Edge Acoustics, uh, but it's one of many. So in a way, on the smaller scale, they're solving this problem. So I keep thinking about, you know, this question of, well, how do we, how do we solve this problem on a larger scale? And um, this is what, again, starting out with acoustic ecology and with Schaefer's uh, ideas, this is what he suggests, active and analytical listening, um, Vocabulary of sonic elements to help us analyze and assess soundscapes. So, so these are the building blocks of how do you build a culture of what he called sonological competence. Um, and, and what kinds of techniques and transformations can give you, um, can give you access into layers of the soundscape. So I do like, I mean, they're a little bit... Um, data driven almost I, I I'm curious whether Schaefer was sort of inspired by by systems thinking and data collection and in, in the early the 70s era of cybernetics um, but I do find that his exercises of like recording mapping classification analysis are interesting creative tools they're interesting ways to transform sound into another experience to transform one sensory experience into another sensory modality and thus reflect on that transformation. So I do like these exercises for nothing else, for, for that reflection of, you know, what does it tell me about my listening when I create a sound map, I draw a sound map and I've, I've drawn it a certain way. Um, and of course, uh, including stakeholders in urban planning interventions is, would be really important. Um, so what is, what would be one way of understanding more holistically, kind of stepping back and, and, and thinking of the city as this vast, complex system or space? And, um, again, from Schaefer, one of the, um, one of the concepts that he articulates is this idea of a tonal center. Um, Schaefer talked a lot about material cultures and that through history, you know, depending on uh, materials and kind of styles of building that you would have wood cultures or bamboo cultures and that those would be referring to, yes, the main materials used for construction, but that, but they would also result in very particular soundscapes, very particular atmosphere or ambience. And our tonal center in the cities post uh, industrialization post kind of modernity is, as he said, the electric revolution has given us new tonal centers of prime unity against which all other sounds are now heard. And that being the internal combustion engine now provides the fundamental sound of contemporary civilization. And this is true. I mean, we part of the sonic heartbeat of the city, um, the, the daily 
rhythms of the city, uh, sonically at least, are all around rush hour in major cities. Um, and that affects air quality, uh, of course. There's, there's spikes in air pollution at rush hour, but also noise and sound and density and vibration. So I've been trying to focus on developing areas in the city and, um, and, and practice this method of listening to layers, listening, um, listening in different ways. Uh, Schaefer suggests listening as orchestration, but I'm more interested, and, and he suggests, um, you know, these musical terms, very, very much musical terms, listening to texture, density, gestures, um, figure ground relations, dynamics, rhythm. And I think those give a really interesting ideas um, and really interesting findings about the nature and the, the um yeah, the orchestration of certain soundscapes. But what I'm more interested in is these concepts of economics, history, identity, politics, power. So how do you listen in cities for cultural tensions? How do we combine this kind of transformation, sensorial transformation, and this, this kind of focus with this um, kind of critical uh, lens. So I'm going to play you an example here of um, this is an example of a recording that I made um, during the early months of the pandemic when all of us who work in sound were extremely, you know, just uh, attuned to the environment and listening uh, because, it, you know, what else? does one do, you know, we're locked at home. Uh, this was also my submission um, to a project uh, called uh, Sound Outside. And I'm going to let you listen to it. And then I want to, um, I might not play the whole thing, but but then I want to kind of explain what we're hearing because um, you, you couldn't possibly interpret it without context. And that's my point. So I don't know if you were able to hear this um, and, and how well the sound is coming through in your space, but um, we start out with a, quite a rich bird chorus. Um, again, a lot of us were, or at least I was very focused on the spring birds because it was March, April. And for the first time, I think I was really aware of the arrival and the song the songs of spring birds and and also how many more birds there are than other times of the year so it's the first times that uh, that a lot of us became aware of this kind of seasonal event that normally goes unnoticed because we're busy living our lives um, 
uh, there, there's not a lot of traffic because uh, th this was early day, so it was almost uh, full lockdown. Um, a lot of businesses were, a ton of businesses were closed. M most workplaces were closed, so people weren't really commuting very much. There were still approvals for construction, so you might hear some hammering on metal, like metal hammer on metal somewhere in the distance. But there's also a rhythmic beat that comes through. It's quite muffled, but I hope that you heard it. And what that is, is um, an, an indigenous hand drum. And the reason why I was hearing that, this is a, a recording that I made from my balcony. The reason why I was hearing that was because um, just before the beginning of the pandemic, there had been um, a lot of protests led by indigenous land defenders um, from Wet'suwet'en um, Wet'suwet'en um, to defend local old growth forests, uh, to defend land from um, pipeline uh, installation. And they had been gathering at various points in the city and using drums to kind of create this different sort of sonic presence. So again, I'm, I want to reflect on the juxtaposition between, you know, the truckers blowing the horns and just kind of punching through everybody's sonic space and, um, and the drums that you hear. So this was a kind of a last uh, echo, really, of these protests, uh, these environmental protests led by indigenous folks using their traditional, um, you know, music making um, instruments to raise awareness. So um, I want to move the conversation in our last little bit towards uh, the project that I really want to talk to you about, uh, my, my most recent project called Cityscape. Um, and I want to start, I want to move there by, uh, by talking about material cultures. What I mentioned earlier about Schaefer um, speaking of material cultures and how they engender a very particular um, sonic character, not just for a certain place, but at a certain time, at a certain time in history, because of the usage of different building materials and construction styles and an organization of cities, we have um, these material cultures that result in sonic cultures. So uh, part of my past work has been around this idea of livable soundscapes um, in a way critically questioning the word livability, which is a big buzzword um, in ratings of cities and ratings of infrastructure around the world. Um, but what does it mean to have livable soundscapes and what tools do we need to imagine? livable and inclusive soundscapes, because in order for us to build something that isn't quite there, we have to first imagine what it could be. Um, and I wanted to, to um, share these pictures again, they're not um, random. Uh, these are all buildings from Vancouver, or British Columbia, my, my local area. And uh, this odd looking uh, futuristic High rise is a building near one of the. Um, it's a it's it's a, in development kind of area of uh, of the seawall, formerly quite abandoned and disheveled, but now they're uh, the city is trying to you know dress it up and uh, make it look nice. Um, there's actually in that um, hole in the middle. I don't know how else to describe it. That's a suspended hot tub. You, you literally, it's transparent on the bottom. You literally can see people's butts when you uh, walk underneath. So um, I, I find it's just such an interesting example of a material, material choices. I mean, there's a softness to the edges of the building, but it's all... Um, it represents to me this drive in Vancouver, this culture in Vancouver to be a modern industrial North American capital. And that materially translates to a lot of metal and glass. 
which in turn is very, very resonant and reverberant and reflective. And so it does nothing to dampen the noise that already exists. On the other hand, um, the the wooden structure pictures um, is also it's a it's a local story also from British Columbia, and it talks about how the city has changed certain height requirements uh, or height regulations for building, and so uh, it allows developers to build more higher structures out of wood. So they can literally build high rises out of wood. Now that engenders different problems, problems of, of clear cutting and logging, which is already a um, quite a pain pain point in BC. Um, and that in addition to the fact that um, it rains so much that wood is, while the, one of the cheapest materials, it's not actually a very sustainable material for building because it, it uh, the constant moisture causes a lot of rot. And then the bottom picture is an example to me of, of a real like community level, um, human level kind of um, uh, city supported structure, which is the farmer's market. Um, once again, it's not a very, it's a pedestrian city and it's a biking city. People do like to be outdoors and to, to do a lot of hiking, but um, it rains so much. It's kind of hard to have a real outdoorsy pedestrian gathering culture. But the farmers markets have been, and also car free days where they, they close down certain streets to traffic. And so the whole street becomes uh, like an open market. Um, these are attempts by the city to create more of a slow streets movement, more of a pedestrian culture, more of a kind of slowing down, um, less noise competition, um, more sounds of community. So it's an attempt at community building. Um, and so the question really is what do livable communities sound like? That's the question. You know, it's that, is this a livable community? Um, this uh, futuristic high rise with the suspended hot tub, is that a livable community? Or is, is this wood uh, skyscraper paradise a livable community? I mean, that certainly would result in a much softer overall sonic ambience. Um, and the farmer's market would probably be quite, you know, buzzing with, with people and conversations and live music. So you could consider it too loud, perhaps, but... Um, it's the kind of loudness that feels community oriented rather than annoying. So um, with all this in mind, um, my work shifted from this idea of livable soundscapes to um, creating a table talk, a sandbox game. This is a table talk game for testing out urban situations. Um, it's uh, to say that it's based on real findings from applied acoustics, it's, it's a bit um, ambitious because um, I wanted to incorporate um, situations that could be solved in the game by, um, by applying real guidelines that exist. But I ended up um, addressing the game a little bit more towards uh, potentially um, school age education and thinking of it more in terms of civic literacy. So the game will be a tabletop game that at the same time creates a live soundscape mix that you can hear through a, a little speaker in the middle of the game board that reflects the configuration of the game board. So reflects sonically the configuration of the game board. So in a way I'm, I'm, uh, I'm intending this project to be like an instrument for hearing the sonic consequences of urban planning. Um, these are pictures of some of the early uh, physical prototyping that we're doing right now. And the game is modeled after drop mix, which um, if uh, I suspect none of you are aware because for some reason that game just flashed and went away. Um, but it's so cool. It's a um, it's a DJing game for kids uh, and it comes with uh, a deck of cards and a tray 
with five slots that you can put down cards. So you create a combination of five cards and through a Bluetooth connection, you hear um, your live music mix that you've DJed. You hear that from your phone, from an app. And it's quite amazing because every combination of cards basically results in a mix that sounds great because the cards have the ability to, um, well, the coding in the cards, um, they connect with each other. And so they, uh, they come into the same tone, uh, tonality and key and tempo. And so they're, they're matched up and they, they sound good together. Um, and what I really liked about drop mix is that it's a very user-friendly physical interface. Like the cards feel like just real cards. Um, and the tray is very easy to use. Um, but then you're hearing the mix and you have this amazing multimodal connection between your, you know, your actions and, um, the live result that you're hearing. So in Cityscape, what we thought that we would have is um, character cards. This is generally the kind of game mechanics um, that I want to present. Character cards, so you can play as an architect, a planner, an entrepreneur, a pigeon, or a tree. So we wanted to also introduce non-human actors into this sort of design the urban soundscape game. Um, that's kind of the tagline for Cityscape is design the urban soundscape. So um, depending on your character, you will have particular goals. So obviously the goals of a planner would be different from the goals of a tree. The goals of an architect might be different than the goals of an entrepreneur. Um, then we, we wanted to bring in this idea of material cultures by creating a set of material cards that would be the, the building blocks of whatever uh, other, you know, imaginary structures you would put together in, this, in the city planning, um, in the game board. So the materials that we have so far are dirt, metal, plastic, wood, glass, um, but there could be more, of course. Um, the mechanic that we've come up with is that every character will use salvage points to buy materials and then use them to create city elements, ultimately trying to satisfy the character goal for their character. Um, in addition to that, we have three meters that correspond to um, the configuration of the game board. And the three meters are a noise meter, an industry meter, and a community spirit meter. And the importance of these meters, they're, um, they're going to be moved manually at the end of each round when players finish that round. Um, and the importance of these meters is, is for, uh, that to me is the most key learning point, is that you realize that there's a real connection between increasing or decreasing the noise meter and increasing or de decreasing the community spirit. And there's a real relationship between noise and industry and a, a, and a real sort of negative relationship between industry and community spirit. So um, that's the goal of that. And every time a new card is placed on the game board, a new sound mixes into the sound mix. So we have like a layer, a layered soundscape going on at any given point in time. Um, the goals of the game are to... Um, not blow out the noise meter. So if you blow out any, if you blow out the noise meter, you lose, everybody loses, but um, you want to achieve certain configurations of the meters. And it's not necessarily to bring the noise meter all the way down because that would decrease community spirit. If you have a silent space, what kind of community could you possibly have? Um, and then with every turn, players see the sonic result of their decision and the relationship between the meter stats. So um, currently we're in developing, we're developing a digital uh, version in, in Max MSP, and a playable digital version with the sound database included. And um, we're hoping to secure more funding to create a bigger, more polished version. 
but it's a uh, the idea of this is that it's a unique sandbox that illustrates the complex interrelationships between infrastructure and city sound in hopefully a kind of playful and creative way. Um, currently, I want to point out, of course, what is missing is um, specific listener perspectives. So we have a sort of we have this idea that, you know, the city soundscape is one, you know, essentialized unified thing but really a, a city soundscape is um the perspective of a particular listener and what's significant to them we were trying to get at that with the character classes so that you you begin to perhaps imagine what would it feel like to listen to the city as a pigeon or as a tree um and we uh, still need to do consultation with community members and iteration of the prototype, um, including that, to do co-design. So uh, just because I know that this overview isn't exactly um, giving you a super clear idea of the game, uh, we have a, a kind of promotional video or a little little overview video that I want to play you that hopefully will give you a sense of how things will sound as well. Cityscape is a tabletop strategy game about city planning and the urban soundscape. When you play, you learn about different values and interests that go into developing a city. Cityscape is an audio augmented game that creates a live and reactive soundtrack based on the cards you place on the board. You can play as an architect, an entrepreneur, a planner, a pigeon, or a tree. Depending on your role, you will salvage materials, build objects, and create ambiences in the city. You have the choice to compete with other players or take on a specific urban scenario. Cityscape allows you to hear the sonic consequences of your actions. With the push and pull of competing interests, the players can either develop the city into an industrial haven or rewild the land and bring about ecological balance. Who will prevail? So thank you for listening. Uh, I'll wrap it up here and I encourage everyone to get in touch with me. Uh, this is my email and uh, I work at the Sonic Research Studio at SFU. Um, and I also want to let everyone know that I will be available for a Q&A um, at the end of, the, of today's session. So uh, please feel free to stay on and, and come and chat with me in person. Well, in person, virtually. And uh, enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>